morning and thank you for joining me on the path to liberty. It's Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. And although this is the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, I thought since I've been doing so many episodes talking about history and strategy, uh, kind of some niche history lessons and things like that, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about nullification in practice today, how we can resist the empire and advance liberty without waiting for permission from the central government to be more free in the first place, which is never going to happen. And this is the time of year that we affectionately call nullification season. And the reason is, is because that's when most state legislatures are in session, generally from about January through April or May. And a number of states Actually, at this time of year, around Christmas season, they already have had pre-filing for legislation for about the last month. So on this episode, I want to share with you some highlights of bills and legislation we're watching in the states. I'll cover some that would protect the Second Amendment, take on the police state, qualified immunity, no-knock warrants, warrantless surveillance, and maybe more, depending on how much time I have. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program. All the archives of the show for about two and a half years now. Individual episodes get their own post, and I link to all the stuff that I reference in each episode. So today, I'm going to be linking to a lot of reports and pieces of legislation so you can actually take that legislation and support it in your state or encourage your own state legislator to file something similar if it's from a different state. You can also find all the platforms we're on. We're on the mainstream platforms like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, Periscope and Twitch, but we're also on a number of others. And I like mentioning them so you know where to find us in case we get booted or when we eventually get booted from one of the other ones. So of course the podcast platforms, Apple, if you're leaving reviews, thank you very much. It helps out a great deal, but Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, Amazon, and elsewhere. And then some video platforms like library.tv, lbry.tv is my favorite right now. We're also on uh, Brighteon, BitChute, BitTube, and elsewhere. Find all that and more over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat while I take uh, a few minutes to allow people to get notifications for the live stream. There's Funky Euphemism, MRGF78, Clay Kent, Justin, Vishnu, Tyler B. Hope you're doing well today, Tyler. I know it's been rough for you, so hope you're feeling a little bit better or soon. D.L. Neal, good to see you, man. Dave Benner, awesome. We just published your, your great Today in History blog post about the Boston Tea Party. For those of you who want to check that out, you can either follow Dave on Facebook or just take a look on our website. You'll find tons of stuff from Dave there. Anna Ray is good to see you. Lawrence Smith, uh, Blind Justice and everyone else. I apologize if I miss, missed anybody, but let's get right to this. And before I get into the news reports about what's been filed as far as legislation to undermine or defeat a federal program, which is unconstitutional. Basically, when you're living under the largest government in the history of the world, almost everything they do is unconstitutional. So you can just kind of take that blanket assertion and just run with it. But I think we need to understand just very, very briefly what nullification is, especially if this is your first time here. And I think the best summary starts from a great article we published by Derek Sheriff maybe about a decade ago. Uh, and he put it this way, the best way to understand what nullification is, is to understand what nullification is not. And let's just, I'm going to read through this just so it makes sense. First of all, Nullification is not secession or insurrection, but neither is it unconditional or unlimited submission. Nullification is not something that requires any decision, statement, or action from any branch of the federal government. That might be the most important. We are not looking for voting or Supreme Courts or any of these things. We're not looking for the federal government to start or stop doing anything. Nullification is not, well, we want them to stop doing plenty of stuff, but we're not waiting for them to do it. We're going to create an environment where they can't get done what they want to get done. Nullification is not the result of obtaining a favorable court ruling. Nullification is not the petitioning of the federal government to start doing or stop doing anything. We're not asking them. We're, we're actually doing things to nullify them. Nullification doesn't depend on any federal law being repealed. It does not require 
permission from any person or institution out of one's own state. And if you are new to this, you may have tons of questions. I'm not going to really answer any of them today. How does this play out? Has it ever been used? Is it unconstitutional? What do the courts have to say? Uh, how do you put this into practice? Etc. Etc. Well, we have a full 108 page free download. Some people get it with their membership renewals. Some people get a physical copy, just depending on what we have in inventory. But it's 108 page. It's a free download. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. This is the history, the constitutional basis, the legal basis, the application throughout history of nullification in the first half of that book. And the second half goes through how it has been actually implemented on various issues in states around the country today. So please read that if you haven't, or if you have, just reference it over and over and over. Again, it's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. I will link to that in the show notes so you can check that out. But let's get right to this. I'm just going to blast through and give a quick overview of some of the primary pieces of legislation we have our eyes on right now. This is far from all of it, and it's not covering all the states, and we're not even really uh, fully underway yet because a lot of the, the legislation that gets filed doesn't even happen until the end of the year or the first couple of weeks of January. We expect to see a couple hundred bills, if not more, that we are keeping an eye on and trying to uh, get support for. First of all, I wanna start out covering the right to keep and bear arms, protecting the Second Amendment, which is always under attack, no matter which team is in charge in Washington, D.C. And this legislation from Missouri, Senate Bill 39, was filed by Senator Eric Burleson. It's titled the Second Amendment Preservation Act. It would ban any entity or person, including any public officer or employee of the state and its political subdivisions, all local governments in the state, from enforcing any past present or future federal acts, laws, executive orders, administrative orders, court orders, rules, regulations, statutes, or ordinances that infringe on the right to keep and bear arms. Basically all of them, there's probably some wiggle room, but this is a huge step forward should it get passed. Finally, we've been working on this for a number of years in Missouri, we had a lot of opposition from the NRA years ago. Uh, they've basically kind of gotten out of the way, but the, they certainly, in 2013 or 2014, they really walked the halls trying to get this type of legislation killed. They've just always been bad on anything 10th Amendment. Uh, but here, the bill includes a detailed definition of actions that qualify as an infringement. This is Senate Bill 39 in Missouri, including but not limited to taxes and fees on firearms, firearm accessories, or ammunition not common to all other goods and services. Registration and tracking schemes, the act of forbidding the possession, ownership, or use, or transfer of a firearm, firearm accessory, or ammunition, or any act ordering the confiscation, red flag logs, for example. That's Senate Bill 39. There are two other bills on the House side that's the same legislation. You generally see this happen in Missouri. Not in every state do they do this, but there's a companion bill on the House side. There's a HB 310, which is filed by a freshman, but it was, I think, just a backup in support. But HB 85 is the main one on the House side by Representative Jared Taylor. And it was actually just co-sponsored by the incoming Speaker of the House. And as of this morning, there's a dozen co-sponsors. We need to get it to about 60 or 70. If you live in Missouri, and only in Missouri, call your state representative. You just go to the Missouri.gov, house.missouri.gov, house.mo.gov to look up your state legislator with your address. And you're gonna call you're going to call, a phone call has so much more impact. Call your state representative and say, hey, I live in your district and I want you to co-sponsor House Bill 85. Email them if you need to, but a phone call will have far more impact. So we're gonna be watching that in Missouri. Similar legislation, not as strong, but still pretty solid in Texas was filed uh, late last month by Representative Matt Krause, or Krause, he's from Fort Worth. This is House Bill 365, or 635. The bill would prohibit state agencies and law enforcement officers from having contract with, or in any other manner provide assistance to a federal agency or official with respect to the enforcement of a federal statute, order, rule, or regulation purporting to regulate a firearm, firearm accessory, or firearm ammunition if the statute, order, rule, or regulation imposes a prohibition, restriction, or other regulation 
such as a capacity or size limitation or a res registration requirement that does not exist under the laws of this state. Now, we certainly want the gun control laws under the laws of the state gone, but the way to get some clarity and actually get something to move forward rather than just waiting on the courts to tell us, and that really just has not played out too well. We've got how many decades since the National Firearms Act of 1934 over and over and over. We got court case after court case, and we keep hearing, oh, this is the way to do things. But no, 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 no. If you read the 10th Amendment Center.com slash report, you'll learn that uh, voting the bums out or waiting on the court is what you do on the side. But your first action really needs to be resistance, nullification, and undermining these federal acts in the first place. So we want to see them all dealt with. But once you get the feds out of the way, then people will realize, OK, well, now we need to repeal this state law. And then you can focus more locally where it's a little bit easier. Well, sometimes it's a little bit easier. And each law you remove from state statute also creates a twofer the state will no longer enforce the federal version either. So this is a really good foundational step forward should it pass in Texas. There's another bill that only, that does the same type of thing, but only for anything new passed starting in 2021. We often see this from Republicans. When Democrats are in office, they'll just want to say, OK, this we're just going to take on anything coming from the new administration, for example, or from the other party. But we really need to cover everything from day one. But we would take this as a foundational step forward should it pass if 635. This is Texas House Bill 112. I just wanted to mention that one. It's kind of a backup piece of legislation in case there's too much opposition for the other bill. And then, of course, there's House Bill 336. This is a report from T.J. Martinell that we published on December 7th titled the Anti-Red Flag Act. This is in Texas, House Bill 336. The legislation would prohibit any city, county, or state official from enforcing any federal statute purporting to implement or enforce an extreme risk protected protective order. The state would also be prohibited from accepting federal grants to enforce such measures. And anyone attempting to enforce such laws would be guilty of a fe felony. So if you want to stop red flag laws and you expect them to come from Washington, D.C., you literally just opt out. You say we aren't going to accept any funding to participate with them and we're going to make it a felony to try to enforce that. That's House Bill 336 in Texas from Representative Briscoe Kane. I've not heard of Briscoe Kane. If you want to learn more about the strategy to nullify federal gun control, I did an episode just in November, Second Amendment Preservation, Foundation to Nullify Federal Gun Control. I will include a link to that in the show notes so you can learn specifically more details about the strategy to undermine and defeat federal gun control without waiting on the feds to do it which is absolutely never going to happen. Next up, I want to talk about no-knock warrants. The idea, well, the idea, there's nothing in the Constitution of the federal government or of any of the states that say no-knock warrant. But it's a judicial fiction that's been enforced on, thrown on all 50 states, and they basically operate like this. And the way to deal with it is literally to say, we're no longer going to do what the Supreme Court has told everyone they can do. And the first state that I've really followed on this has been Virginia. Just uh, in the last couple of months, uh, a bill was signed into law that prohibits any Virginia law enforcement officer from seeking executing or participating in the execution of a no-knock search warrant. All under the law, all search warrants must be executed by an officer recognizable and identifiable as a uniform law enforcement officer. So that one is the first one that we're really following here. There might be others that I'm not aware of, and it goes into effect on March 1st, 2021. There are a number of other states that are considering legislation to do something similar. For example, in South Carolina, House Bill 3089, 3089, that was pre-filed on December 9th. The legislation, this is from Mike Meharry's report on it, would require any law enforcement officer executing a warrant in the state to physically knock and announce himself and wait a minimum of 15 seconds. I know a lot of the experts say you got to have 30, but 15 seconds to allow the occupants of the home to respond and open the door before forcibly entering the home. It's a brief pause. It still gives them the ability to blast through if they need to, but it, this will lower the conflict potential, especially if you're talking about people who are defending their home and their property. 
the odds of someone actually who is trained to defend themselves against an armed entry is going to create a really, really nasty, violent situation. So this will help in that House Bill 3089. Should it pass? I think it's going to be very difficult in South Carolina, but we're definitely watching that. A similar bill, Senate Bill 175 in Texas would ban Texas judges. So this one doesn't actually apply directly to the police. This piece of legislation would uh, apply to the judges from issuing warrants, allowing no knock entry. The bill defines no knock entry as a peace officer's entry for the purpose of executing a warrant into a building or other place without giving notice of the officer's authority or purpose before entry. In New Jersey, Assembly Bill 4286 uh, would, before executing an arrest or search warrant, would require police to take these steps. One, knock on the door. Two, clearly and verbally announce the officer's identity and the reason for the officer's presence. And three, absent exigent circumstances, wait a reasonable amount of time, but not less than 30 seconds for occupants to answer the door, whichever is greater before entering the premises. Now, of course, again, as I mentioned, this is something that we've gotten from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has nationalized policing. The federal government has nationalized policing and makes one size fits all uh, dictations really to the whole country. And so law enforcement all across the country are basically following the opinions of the Supreme Court. Uh, here in New in not New York, in Kentucky, there's a bill that we don't have a number on yet. It's Bill Request 22. We'll keep an eye on what, when that turns into an actual uh, legislative number. But this would ban, effectively ban no-knock warrants. It would require a police officer executing a warrant to take the following steps. Again, physically knock on the door in a manner and duration that can be heard by the occupants. Clearly announce in a manner that can be heard by the occupants that law enforcement is executing a search warrant. Wait a minimum of 10 seconds or for a reasonable amount of time. I think there's some loopholes there, but this is again, another positive, potentially positive step forward. If you want to learn more about no knock warrants, where they came from, how the Supreme Court basically thrust them on all 50 states and what to do very similar. I covered a number of these pieces of legislation in that episode as well, just late last month. Nullify the police state, no knock warrant edition. I will link to that in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Very closely tied to uh, dealing with the police state, of course, is qualified immunity. We have two pieces of legislation, House Bill 88. In Senate Bill 161, again in Texas, Texas does most of the pre-filing in this time of year. We also have some from South Carolina and elsewhere. But this legislation would create a cause of action in state courts to sue police officers who, under the color of law, deprive the person of or cause the person to be deprived of a right, privilege, or immunity secured by the Texas Constitution. Now, this is a real good Tenth Amendment approach because they're basically taking something that was created out of thin air judicial fiction by the Supreme Court forced on all 50 states through the incorporation doctrine, also legal fiction. And instead of actually, they've created this thing where anytime a law enforcement officer potentially does something that uh, violates someone right, someone's rights, it becomes a federal case. And the federal courts have created a situation where it's almost impossible to sue any government agent, even on a state or a local level, in federal court and win. They created a series of tests that I've covered in the past and that is briefly covered in this article as well. You can read that. Of course, it will be linked in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I want to make sure you guys have that so you know where to go in case you can't find us if we suddenly disappear from platforms. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. So basically what they've taken is this federal process and now they're looking at this legislation and they're saying, no, 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 no. We're going to make this a state level process. That doesn't mean that the state government agents are good people or anything, or the state legislators are good people. They're probably all just awful anyways, the courts, the judges, etc. But now you're actually the negative effects of a case that happens in one state don't have the same kind of spillover effect to all the other 50 states if you make it a federal case. So this is how we should be dealing with things, looking more inwards towards the state or a local level. That's in Texas, House Bill 88 and Senate Bill 161. Meharry just told me this morning, we're actually looking at another piece of legislation in Texas. This one specifically only deals with law enforcement officers. There's another bill that was just filed that I think he's covering pretty soon that would cover all government agents because they all have some level of qualified immunity. 
Moving forward, I want to talk about constitutional carry legislation. I'm not a big fan of the name constitutional carry. We use it. We put it in quotes generally in our reports. I don't like it because it implies that you get your right to carry, your right to keep and bear arms from the Constitution or from the Second Amendment to the Constitution. And if you watched my show on Monday, I briefly talked about this in regards to the right to keep and bear arms. But I talked about the revolutionary principles that led up over a period of 12 years from 1764 to 1776. I highlighted a number of the, the top resolutions, speeches, books, papers, and the like that talked about rights being natural, inalienable rights. Rights that we have from the Creator, from our birthright as being humans, from the laws of nature. They aren't granted by government. The right to keep and bear arms is not a Second Amendment right. It is not a constitutional right. The right to carry doesn't come from the Constitution. I think the name is actually bad. We shouldn't use it. I'm conflicted. I like using it because it gets a lot of attention. People know what we're talking about and we don't have to explain it as much. But it does kind of keep in process that... I don't know. I'm interested in your thoughts. I'm thinking about this out loud because I'm thinking about strategy for the future because I don't want people to, to think of their rights as coming from the Constitution. The Constitution limits either the state or the federal government depending on which Constitution you're looking at or on what issue. But anyways, a constitutional carry bill pre-filed for the 2021 legislative session, this is again from T.J. Martinell, would make it legal for Alabama residents to carry a firearm without a license in the state. Fostering, envir fostering an environment hostile to federal gun control. The notion in that statement, I think, is very powerful because what makes it really easy for the feds to enforce a prohibition on anything or everything on any particular item, whether it's a plant or a gun or a person or whatever, the way that they can do this is when people aren't actually interacting with those items or people or whatever very often when they're kind of hidden and they're scary because it's a lot easier to whip up support against something when it's not part of the day-to-day -day lives of average people. So the idea of having more and more people caring, open caring, concealed caring, those who are trained to do so, I don't, I'm terrible. I'm trying to learn. Uh, when I get a chance, I go to, a, there's a, a gun club here in downtown LA, Los Angeles Gun Club on 6th Street in an old warehouse that, but I suck. So I am not qualified. I need to get some lessons and someday I'll get to that level. But people who are trained and really know what they're doing, the more that people are doing this and the more that people see that this is actually a positive, it's a self-defense for person, property, and it's also the right to keep and bear arms is really to, not to necessarily to, uh, uh, Man, the, the founders wanted us all really to have military-style weapons so there wouldn't be such a need for a huge standing army. And for those of you who are following the National Defense Authorization Act thing going on, the largest spending year in and year out on militarism, the more that people have self-defense, the less we need that kind of garbage. I don't think we need it right now anyways, but that educates the public. Look, we can take care of ourselves here. Anyways, Sen Senator Ger Gerald Allen from Tuscaloosa pre-filed Senate Bill 5. Alabama state law currently allows residents 19 or older to apply for permits at the county level. Under the proposed law, anyone who is legally allowed to own a gun could carry it concealed without a state-issued license. It's not liberty if it comes with a government permission slip, so you could do it without, an, without this license. However, gun owners would still be restricted from bringing weapons to certain places already prohibited by state and federal law. That is part of it. It may also be respecting some property rights. I haven't looked really closely at that, but Senate Bill 5 actually opens the door for more and more people carrying concealed without a state issued license. That's Alabama Senate Bill 5. We also have a similar piece of legislation from Jonathan Hill, uh, House Bill 3039 in South Carolina and B. Cox, I don't know who that is, House Bill 2096 COX from Greenville County, 
uh, were filed in South Carolina on December 9th. I will link to those in the show notes as well so you can take a look at that. Now I want to talk about some surveillance. We're watching a bill in Massachusetts, Senate Bill 2963, which is a massive piece of legislation. There's some junk in it. Uh, there's some average stuff, but there's also a piece that I think was kind of snuck in there that dealt with facial recognition surveillance. If you've heard me talk about facial recognition, you know that you can't use facial recognition in a public place and follow the standard of a warrant based on probable cause, particularly describing the person, place, or thing to be searched or seized. You cannot because it's a broad blanket search of everyone walking by and it's recording and tracking people where they go based on scanning and searching an image of their face. Under this proposed law, which was sent to the governor, and I think the governor did a line item veto on something, so it's in the process, the final stages in Massachusetts, 2963, it would be unlawful for a public agency or public official to acquire, possess, access, use, assist with the use of, or provide resources for the development or use of any biometric surveillance system or to enter into a contract with or make a request to any third party for the purpose of acquiring, possessing, or accessing, or using information derived from a biometric surveillance system. That is defined as, quote, any computer software that performs facial recognition or other remote biometric recognition. That could include a gate scan, audio scans, uh, different types of ways that they can actually monitor, track, trace where you're going, who you're spending time with, what protest, what church, what gun club, what anything that you're going to, what political event you're going to. This would ban them from using it, acquiring it, or even having third parties. It could be the federal government. It could be a third party private corporation. It could be anything. But that's an actual pretty across the board ban. One of the broadest ones we've seen, Senate Bill 2963 in Massachusetts. I'm not sure if the governor there will sign that thing or if it's not going to get trashed in the second round that we're watching here, but we should know what happens in the next week or so. Uh, a similar bill was filed in South Carolina to deal with stingray spying or cell site simulators. This is from Representative Todd, Todd Rutherford, House Bill 3138. And Mike Meharry points out that the proposed law would ban South Carolina law enforcement agencies from purchasing or using cell site simulators commonly known as stingrays. These devices, he writes, essentially spoof cell phone towers, tricking any device within range into connecting to the stingray instead of the tower or first to the stingray. It's like a pass through. It'll go to the stingray, the cell site stim simulator. It's software based in most situations. It's just on a laptop in a cop car and all the signals come in and then it passes through seamlessly. You're making a phone call. You don't even know that all your data is being downloaded uh, to that other device. This allows law enforcement, Mike writes, to sweep up communications content as well as locate and track the person in possession of a specific phone or other electronic device. But it's a needle in the haystack because everyone who can connect to that tower at a place like Los Angeles or a big city, you could be like four, five, 10,000 people, 2,000 people that are all connected, uh, 200, whatever. Again, that's still not a warrant based on probable cause, particularly describing the person, place, or thing to be searched or seized. You cannot do this. This is a needle in a haystack. You're collecting information on hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of people when you look at the big picture of how it's happening. And then what happens is anytime they collect that information, it doesn't just stay in South Carolina or it doesn't stay with the LAPD. They pass it along through information sharing environment and fusion centers, and it goes to all the federal agencies that do surveillance, the DEA, uh, ICE, FBI, DHS, and it goes to all other police departments through fusion centers. Boise can access it. Uh, in South Carolina, if they uh, track where someone is, someone wants to look that up in Texas, they're going to be able to do that. Government, of course. Police often obtain and use Stingray technology in complete secrecy, writes Mike, uh, and use it to track people and gather electronic data without a warrant. House Bill 3138, it would ban them from using, it would ban them from purchasing any new, and it would require any, any agency who already has one of these devices to destroy it, to get rid of it. They're not allowed to keep them. And then just one last one that I want to mention. We don't have a report on this yet. I just saw it yesterday. This was uh, authored by Senator Nathan Dom in Oklahoma, Senate Bill 135. 
the Defend the Guard Act. This is one of the most important bills, probably the most difficult one to get passed. We expect to see it filed. And a dozen, I'm hearing as many as 20 states this year. That's what we expected last year before everything got kind of shut down. But this would ban the use of state National Guard troops, National Guard troops in Oklahoma, from being deployed to overseas wars without a declaration of war as required of Congress by the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16. Uh, so Oklahoma Senate Bill 135, we'll have a report on that soon. Uh, I know Dom has filed that uh, bill in the past, so I expect that it's probably the same thing. In the past, it's been very good. I haven't read it in detail, but we'll be reporting on that over on the 10th Amendment Center website in the near future. I know Mike Meharry has that. Anyways, I hope you guys found this interesting. What you really need to do for any of these people, any of these pieces of legislation that you find resonates with you. Not everyone finds every issue to be something that they want to take action on. Some people only want to work to defend the right to keep and bear arms. Some people only want to work on privacy or asset forfeiture or sound money. There's other pieces of legislation that we're going to be covering in the near future too. But if you like it and you support the idea, click the link in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. Look at the bill. You're going to be able to read the bill in full and send it to your own state legislator. Say, hey, this bill was filed in South Carolina, or this bill was filed in Texas, or in Missouri. I would like to see something similar filed in this state. And I don't mean your state representative in the Imperial House, or your state, or your senator in the Imperial Senate. A lot of times people will do this. We'll ask them, send this to your state senator and state rep, and the first thing they think of is sending to is like Ted Cruz or something like that. And that is absolutely incorrect. We're not trying to work with the federal government we're trying to resist, undermine, defeat, and nullify federal programs uh, in the states without first getting permission from Washington, D.C. Again, so you definitely want to take action and send the legislation. If you live in a state where you heard about legislation that you support, literally call your state senator and state representative, give them the bill number, and say, hey, I'd like you to support, for example, Senate Bill 135 in Oklahoma. Please co-sponsor this, because the more co-sponsors you get on this legislation or on House Bill 85, in uh, Missouri, the more co-sponsors you get, the more likely it is to get a committee hearing, a committee vote, and then once it gets out of the committee, it has to go to the floor, it gets a debate, and then it goes. To, once it passes there, it goes to the other chamber. So there's a lot of steps in this process, and it really takes a lot of work in the grassroots to make it happen. But we'll be covering that in more detail in the coming weeks. If you want to uh, learn more about that, again, it's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. If you support what we're doing, you like the show, you enjoyed this information. I hope it was educational. Please smash the like button, subscribe, get notifications, reviews on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform helps us spread the word. All of the platforms, the mainstream platforms, have algorithms that are pretty easily triggered. So all of those actions tell the algorithm to show the program to more people. Thank you so much for helping us spread the word. And of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, it takes a lot of effort every single day, day in and day out. We're rolling up our sleeves, but for as little as two bucks a month, you can help us reach and teach new people about the Constitution and liberty and how to advance it how to support it and implement it right now and into the future. That's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.